Welcome to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Michael Steen, and in today's episode, we're looking at financial stability. The coronavirus pandemic is shaping our economic and financial environment. Massive policy support has lessened the economic impact of the virus. But as Europe goes through a second wave of rising infections and lockdowns, the prospect of a new economic downturn is again a cause for concern. And one aspect that we'd like to explore a bit more is the functioning of the financial system and financial stability. Our first guest today is John Fell from our Financial Stability Department at the ECB. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Michael. So we're talking about financial stability. At first glance, that might seem pretty self-explanatory, essentially a stable financial system that's made up of companies and households, banks, stock exchanges, payment systems, financial markets, and so on. But John, could you maybe talk us through a bit what it means um, and what your definition is and and what we expect from a stable financial system? Sure. Um, But I think the first thing to say is that Um, Financial stability is often defined um, with reference to its opposite. So the reason for that is financial instability is easier to observe. Features often include collapses of asset prices, bank failures, runs, credit crunch, higher unemployment. Um, It's more challenging to characterize financial stability. Um, Now, I think three necessary elements to ensure financial stability and they're actually described in a special feature article that myself and Gary Shinazi, um, who was at the IMF at the time, published in the June 2005 Financial Stability Review. Okay, we'll put that in the show notes so you will link to it. And we basically characterized three different elements. So the first um, is financial intermediation between savers and investors is being facilitated. So savers are putting money on deposit in banks and then it comes out the other end uh, as loans and then the risks are being priced appropriately. The second element is that the management of risk within the financial system. So here I mean, for example, uh, financial intermediation takes place not only between banks and their non-financial sector customers, but also between banks themselves between financial institutions, between institutions and markets. The condition would be that that management is efficient and effective. And then the third, and I think it's probably the best known, that the financial system is capable of of absorbing shocks so that financial intermediation is not interrupted. Um, Now, that probably sounds a bit abstract, so I'd like to use a metaphor uh, to explain what I mean. So consider a, a cyclist on a bicycle. Uh, Now, the cyclist is the real economy and the bicycle is the financial system. And the cyclist wants to get from A to B. And so as not to complicate matters, let's say we're going over a flat terrain. Now, we impose one constraint on the cyclist. The cyclist is, is not allowed to let her feet touch the ground. So what happens if the cyclist stops pedaling? Well, she'll fall off. She'll fall off. So instability. What happens if the chain breaks? It's going to fall off again. Again, or, instability. Yeah. And then third, suppose the tires on the bicycle are very thin. What happens if the cyclist runs over a nail causing a puncture uh, to one or both of the tires? Going to fall off again. Again, instability. So the concept of financial stability has many dimensions and it's complex um, to analyze. Uh, but those three elements, when they come together, ensure that you have, you have a, f- a stable financial system. So any of these problems on the bike basically can lead to a, a bigger failure. So a small thing going wrong, like a puncture, leads to a bigger failure, which is the, the rider falling off the bike. That's right. So we're talking then about balance and the system not being thrown out of balance. Um, can you tell us about some episodes in history um, where, where we've seen that loss of balance? In other words, when we've seen financial instability. Well, I think, I mean, the, probably the one that people are, are, have been most familiar with before the, the COVID-19 shock was the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009. I think that can be analysed through the lens of the, the, the cyclist bicycle metaphor um, that I've just explained. So first, it had its origins in a, in a US housing market boom uh, where easy access to mortgage finance stoked a bubble and then that bubble burst. And that was channel one. Um, the cyclist stopped pedaling. 
Uh, second, then within the financial system, banks had become overly reliant on short term, unsecured interbank funding and banks had repackaged mortgage loans into securities with higher credit risk than the investors um, realised. When the housing market bubble burst, banks became wary of each other's exposures uh, to the housing market and they stopped lending to each other and the values of mortgage backed securities collapsed as well. And so that was channel two, um, the bicycle chain broke. Um, and then third, uh, when the losses came, it turned out that banks had, had insufficient buffers, both liquidity and capital, to absorb the losses. And the end result was a credit crunch which, which fed back to the real economy as some borrowers were unable to obtain the credit that they needed. Now that was channel three, uh, the tires uh, were punctured. So in the global financial crisis, almost everything that could go wrong did. Uh, the cyclists stopped pedalling, the bicycle chain broke and the tyres were punctured. So if we fast forward to today and we, we're seeing this economic shock brought on by the um, coronavirus pandemic, um, which is of a comparable, if not greater magnitude, um, but there's also a lot of differences. I mean, this is a, a, a mainly a health crisis as the global financial crisis, as you were just describing, had its roots very much in the financial system. We've talked a lot about the, the pandemic already, but in, uh, in this uh, series of podcasts, but in terms of financial stability, um, how has the pandemic affected the financial system? Uh, we've seen a lot of sectors have suffered, but has it actually thrown the financial system out of this balance? So, I mean, as you quite rightly said, Michael, that the shock clearly came from outside the financial system. And the initial impact was a substantial across the board fall in equity prices and a widening of credit spreads in corporate bond markets. Uh, sectors that are most vulnerable to social distancing, so airlines, hospitality, recreation, etc., uh, were hit particularly hard. Banks were also hit uh, dis disproportionately. And as we often see, um, investors wanted their money back when they saw uh, losses in their investment fund accounts. And this caused something resembling, um, not quite, but something, something resembling a run on investment funds. And then at the same time, firms seeing their cash flows collapsing um, because they were not earning revenue, um, because of social distancing measures, they needed cash to pay their bills. That resulted in, 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 a, in a dash for cash. And all of that fed back into financial markets, causing asset prices to fall even further. Now, that was that was in March. The turbulence didn't last very long uh, as policymaking authorities, and that included fiscal, monetary and prudential, came up with a vigorous response. So the conditions did not get out, get out of hand. And so uh, the liquidity stresses were addressed. And that was yeah, also thanks, by the way, to the range of monetary policy actions that the ECB itself took. Uh, but we don't think that all the challenges are now resolved as we expect, uh, for example, non-performing loans to rise. And we have concerns at present about the levels of indebtedness in the sovereign and corporate sectors, which could grow even further. Now, I should say that twice a year, the ECB um, produces a financial stability review, and we've actually timed the release of today's podcast with the latest one. And it seems that one of the messages from the latest review is that the, the financial system was in a better position uh, to maintain financial stability this this time round. Uh, you've already touched on that a bit, but can you expand on that a little bit more, please, John, and, and talk a bit more about the differences that we're seeing this time to last time? Sure. OK, well, I mean, I think the first the first point that is important um, is that the shock didn't originate um, in within the financial system. But we had been warning for some time in the FSR. Now, this is pre COVID-19 um, that there were important sources of risks and vulnerabilities for, for financial stability. And that this would have been in the issue of last November of 2019 and, and issues um, before that. Um, and we, we have been highlighting for some time four main risks are sources of risk and, and those were uh, first search for yield in financial markets which had compressed uh, risk premium. Uh, so going back to the cyclist bicycle metaphor that was channel two vulnerability to the to the bicycle chain uh, breaking. But, and that was just to explain that a little bit more that's that's investors looking for places to get returns and the but essentially low interest environment, meaning that becomes very difficult. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes. Um, so, I mean, we've seen, for example, that currently the fraction of, of um, fixed income instruments globally that are paying uh, 
two uh, percent or less is about ninety percent of all bonds outstanding in the world um, are paying currently two percent or mm. less. So it's very hard to get a, to get a return above two percent unless you're prepared um, to take on more risk. And of course, what that does by taking on additional risk, it creates this vulnerability of the bicycle chain breaking. The second risk was low bank profitability, and and this would be channel three, some weaknesses in the tires. So the ability of the banking system. The banking system had, going into COVID-19, very high and comfortable capital ratios. But, you know, the economy is dynamic. The banking system needs to be dynamic as well. It needs to grow its capital over time. And the primary source of growing capital is through profitability. And if the banks are unable to earn a decent rate of return on their investment, then the ability over time to retain those buffers becomes compromised. Um, So that's channel three, as I said, weaknesses in the tires. Uh, A third uh, was debt sustainability concerns, and we had been flagging both sovereign and corporate indebtedness as sources of possible risk uh, for financial stability. That would be channel one, the peddling. And then finally, the fourth risk, we had concerns about resilience um, of of the investment fund sector to shocks. That was another weakness in channel three, and that we actually saw materialize. And in fact, in many ways, all of the risks that we had identified in the November 2019 um, financial stability review, those vulnerabilities were to some extent unraveled. Um, but that said, several factors prevented a full-blown financial crisis, including, as I said, the very comfortable uh, capital and liquidity buffers of banks entering into the crisis. Central counterparties or CCPs um, mitigated counterparty risks as well. So the tires of, of the bicycle were thick um, going into COVID-19 and the vigour of preventative uh, policy action also contained the financial in- system impacts before it, it got out of control. John, thanks very much. Um, I don't know if you came on your bike today, but uh, <laughs> if you're going home, <laughs> I wish you a safe trip on it. And thanks for, for explaining that to us. Thanks a lot, Michael. Next, we're going to go into a bit more detail on the subject of businesses. And our next guest, Tamara Shakir, who also works in the ECB's Financial Stability Department, has been looking into this topic for the Financial Stability Review. Tamara, welcome to the ECB podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. Um, Now, lockdowns across Europe and also globally have had a huge impact on companies, forcing many businesses to simply shut up shop for several weeks or sometimes even months. Which policy measures in particular have helped them stay afloat? There have been a huge range of policy measures that have been implemented in the wake of the pandemic um, and right across the euro area and they varied across euro area countries some of them have actually been really special as well and represented governments in particular recognizing what they were facing early on and so i might start with those there have been some ones that are pretty classic policies that happen as soon as economic downturns begin around taxes falling and um and that giving companies more room for maneuver. But also we've seen the implementation of a lot of special schemes. And there's two that I probably draw attention to. One, for example, has been the short time working schemes of various forms across the euro area, which is where governments have supported companies in keeping um, their employees on the books and helping uh, take some of the wage bill pressure off them. And what that's done is it's allowed companies to avoid laying off um, their staff permanently for what might be a temporary shock. Um, And as a result, that's helped keep employment going and it should allow us to recover faster, but it's also helped a lot of families keep income coming in, even if the company they work for is going through a tough time. Okay, and those typically mean that, so the employee gets told, we we only need you for say four days instead of five days um, but the government also helps pay part of the wage is it? Exactly so um, the short time working scheme so for example you might reduce the amount of hours that you ask an employee um, to work um, r- rather than laying them off mm-hmm. entirely. Mm-hmm. So yeah so there's a cut in working hours but you've still got a job. But you've still got a job and you've still got income coming through and that helps households and it's also helped companies not have to lay off staff because laying off staff is also expensive especially if later on you then have to try and recruit them and if you had to do that process then the recovery could be even slower when it eventually comes because companies would have to go through that whole process. So that's been one area of policy. The other one um, that we pay a lot of attention to, particularly in the Financial Stability Review, is that governments have been helping banks to lend to those companies through offering guaranteed loans. So that's where 
a bank at the current time might naturally be a bit reluctant about lending to a company that it doesn't know if it's going to survive after the pandemic or how its business might need to change. So the governments have said, look, we'll take on some of that risk for you. And they've offered these guaranteed loans. Um, And that's been huge, actually. So we've seen a lot of the lending that's been happening in recent months has been backed by these government guarantees. Um, there's also been what they call moratoria and loans, which has allowed um, people to take a break from their loan repayments for a while um, as we go through the pandemic on the basis that eventually they'll be able to recover and return to paying the loan. And that's affected both companies and households, actually. Do we look at most of these then as quite successful policies, you'd say? We look at them as really important, yes. They've yeah. been significant. They came into place really quickly. So you hopefully have reduced what we call scarring effect. So there's been this real concern that what is should be a temporary, and temporary may mean one or two years at the rate we're going, but a temporary episode of the pandemic doesn't have really long lasting effect of companies that were perfectly viable failing or um, people losing their jobs and then having to go and find another job in the future. You talked about this scarring idea. So in terms of the rise in un- unemployment, w- what's the assessment there? So we have seen that pick up in un- unemployment, which is tough for the people who've been laid off, mm. but it's better than it might have been. So if you looked at the size of what's happened, the amount of companies that have had to shut their doors effectively, as you said, Um, during the spring, you might have expected a lot more people to have lost their jobs and we haven't seen that. So what I'm hearing is that we've we've, we've got through this this first phase of this crisis um, quite well, really. And in terms Mm. of if you're putting your financial stability hat on, financial stability was more or less um, being preserved so far, right? Yes. So to the extent that if you, um, you might have worried that banks really would have shut the taps on loans to companies and households right at the point where they needed it, that didn't happen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so that's been a real success. And on top of that, although it's early days, we haven't seen banks failing. So this whole thing could have made a whole, been a whole lot worse if on top of everything, we'd seen uh, banks having weak balance sheets and coming under real pressure. But because of the efforts over the last decade, since the last crisis to put resilience into banks' balance sheet, have them build up their capital positions in particular, they look pretty ready to withstand a lot of what's to come. Okay, so so as as we look into this sort of second wave, we're in a sort of relatively good position, but of course, I mean, you and your colleagues are paid to worry about these things. So what are the kinds of things that you'll be looking at uh, in the next few months, would you say? So I am a bit worried about a few things. Hopefully we get the vaccine or some other measure and the pandemic starts to abate. Even if that happens though, we can't take away the fact that there's been a big impact from this pandemic. And what we need to see is, for example, going back to companies, which of those look like they um, have had such a big change in their business model that maybe they can't quite survive um, or operate the way that they were operating before all this happened. Um, An obvious question might be, how long will it take before, for example, restaurants can think about having the same number of people that they used to have um, uh, on a given evening? And if that number falls fairly permanently or for quite a long time, then that affects their margins and they have to have some deeper thinking about how they run their business. And that'll be the same as true for a whole host of business that centre around social leisure Um, interaction Um, you know if you think this year every single major music concert has been cancelled right every big festival every big thing that's all Mm -hmm. thinking about what does that look like in the future will I ever be in a a crowded nightclub again and and the the companies (laughs) running those kind of businesses uh, those kind of businesses they just that they may have survived so far but there's there could be question question marks marks over whether they do and what that means for those of them that have borrowed money we're going to have to have a look and see what does that mean for those loans and then what in turn are the knock-on effects for banks from that Mm -hmm. um and that in turn indeed right so they get to the point where they can't pay the loan off anymore and then the bank has to declare that a bad loan. And then if there's too many of those for a bank, that becomes a problem for the bank. And it can do, it. yes. Right. I mean, when we've looked at it, one of the things that gives us real confidence is we think a lot of our banks are in, in pretty decent shape. So they have the buffers that should be able to take actually quite sizable losses. And that's not an accident that they have those buffers. That's been the consequence of a concerted effort by people over the last decade 
to um, improve the position of the euro area mm-hmm. banking o- system. Also by ECB banking supervision, we should say on the ECB podcast, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that means that we go into this in a pretty good position. It is a big shock, though. Um, and so we need to see in what that really looks like. Um, we hope that banks uh, themselves also start to make that assessment fairly soon and can start form what we call like, you know, a, a good assessment themselves of what's the expected losses that they might take on their books. And they've been doing that already um, to varying degrees. And I think that's something we, we look at in the financial stability review. You asked about what I'd be worried about in the future. The other consequence, of course, is even for companies and households that um make it through, they are probably going to be carrying a bigger debt burden and also governments are going to be carrying a bigger debt burden. Um, That's all sort of manageable to a certain extent, particularly because financing costs have been really low, partly Mm -hmm. related as well to the ECB. But nonetheless, those debt positions need to be reckoned with in some form. Uh, Hopefully when the economy recovers, that will do a large part of the job. But we've got to keep an eye out on our side. And one of the things I think we are particularly mindful of is a situation where you've got a group of companies that need to look at their situation. You've got banks that have taken on debt in order to help those companies through, and they've done a lot of that through the banking system Mm -hmm. and by offering those loans. Also, we're keeping a careful watch out on the fact that there's this growing interlinkage between the corporate sector, the governments, and the banks. I mean, that's a bit of a reminder of the last crisis with the the so-called sovereign bank nexus, where... um, countries started to get into trouble because their banks got into trouble because the banks had a lot of debt from those countries. Are we in a different world now or is that a, also a concern? It's always tempting to say we're in a different world now, isn't it? Um, I think there are genuine reasons to think parts of that old sovereign bank nexus shouldn't worry us too much. And a lot of that is to do with a combination of both um, monetary conditions, but also actually the action of Europe. So the European recovery programme that's been um, put forward should provide a lot of support to countries that may need it at certain points in time um, to avoid the kind of single country risk that we saw in the sovereign debt crisis. So you've talked a lot about the support that's being offered. Is one of the worries also about how that support ends or how quickly it stops? Yes. So we have seen governments show a lot of commitment to um, being there for companies and and households at the current time. And we've seen some um, schemes extended. But when we look at what's been announced so far, a lot of schemes, some schemes have actually ended already and a lot of them are due to end over the course of 2021. If the economy is recovering well by the time they end, it should all be fine. Um, But there is some risk that if All of these policies, which are doing a massive amount to underpin everything together, all ended at once. It's sort of pulling the rug Mm -hmm. from under uh, people's feet. That could weigh either on the recovery. So it could mean that companies and families and households have to reckon a little bit with that change in their income and the support they're being offered. A sort of more tail risk um, event that we might worry about is a sort of an accident of a bit of... um, policy makers in different countries withdrawing things, not realising kind of that they're pulling as much support away from the economy all at once. Um, and that, and maybe if the economy is economic recovery is more fragile than we realise, it could have an even bigger effect and almost take us back a step before we go forward. The other reason to be worried about it is as time goes on, it seems very likely that there will be some um, policy makers in different parts of the system who might find that they don't have as much room um, to deal with things as they'd like, um, particularly fiscal room, and um, and that might become an issue. So there's all uh, risks of support being taken away too suddenly. I guess on the other hand, there's kind of also, because there's risk everywhere, a risk of the support staying in place for too long. Is, is, would you say so? That is something that as time passes, you'd get a bit more worried about. Um, are there probably particularly businesses that are too reliant almost on the support and it becomes harder to tell whether they're really viable if you take away 
the support. It might not be seen as uh, the best use of public resources if uh, guaranteed loans are being made to companies that don't have a long-term viable business model. And that can be hard to see right now because we don't have all the information about where things are going. So um, both banks and governments are making these decisions sort of in good, um, with good intentions about giving everyone a chance. But in the long term, at some point, we'll have to see which businesses need to adjust and how they need to adjust and or if everything returns to the world of 2019. OK, thank you very much, Tamara. So really a lot to, to think about there. And um, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thank you. That brings us to the end of this episode. We've seen that in the face of this extreme shock, financial stability and the balance within the financial system have been largely preserved. Funds have continued to flow to those who need them, thanks to monetary, fiscal and supervisory policy supports, and the fact that banks are well prepared. Businesses and households have in general been able to keep their assets, avoiding an economic fallout similar to that seen during the great financial crisis. We'll link to the ECB's latest financial stability review in the show notes, as well as other related information. We'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts for future episodes via social media. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Michael Steen. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.